Father, uh, today we do thank you. We thank you for this blessing that we have to gather together in your name. And I pray, God, that as we do open your word, it's not just reading chapters and verses. It's not just reading about things that happened millenniums ago. It's not just stories. But God, I pray that we would understand this is your word. This is spoken to us to change us, to encourage us. God, to draw us closer to you. So impact our lives today as we, as we open this. No matter what we're going through, I know we're coming from a lot of different places. Some people from really, really good places and some people from really, really hard and difficult and, and aggravating places. But I know that your word is sufficient. So bless this time. Open up our hearts, God, that we might receive from you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I almost said Paul, John, right? We're studying the, the book of 1 John. John has been kind of talking to us a lot about we need to deal with our sin. We need to understand we sin. We need to be honest about our sin. We need to confess our sins. He's talked about the fact that we don't deny we sin. And so he's been, listen, he's been encouraging us to deal with with things that kind of affect us from internal, that affect us ourselves. Now he's going to switch a little bit and talk about something that affects us from the outside that is just as dangerous and that we need to pay attention to. And John, listen, John's going to talk about, bottom line, he's going to talk about there's truth and there's not truth. And there are absolutes and we need to understand that. We live in a culture that's done away with absolutes. It's absolutely gone, right? When you think about everything that's going on. We did a wedding yesterday and, and you know, now on the, on the wedding licenses for the state of Arizona, at least for Cochise County, it says applicant one and applicant two, not husband and wife. That's what they, you know, that's what we've come down to. So all of this compromise, no absolutes, and here's what the Bible says, there are absolutes, and they're absolutely true, and it will eventually affect your life. So John is talking to some people that have been influenced by this thing that's uh, later on became Gnosticism. I don't think it's Gnosticism yet, it's a precursor to that, but it's this whole idea, listen, people are, have a different Jesus, they've redefined who Jesus is, and then they come across as super spiritual people. You ever meet any of those? You know, and then, and then they're always, listen, they're always a little mystique, right? And there's just this little bit of mystery, and they always kind of portray it this way. If you only had what I have, you would be okay too. And so, but they never tell you what they have. It's kind of a big secret. Well, they were doing it. Listen, that's not new. You know what amazes me is Satan doesn't have anything new. He just repackages it and renames it, and it comes across again. So it was going on in John's generation. So John has told us at the end of the last time we were together in verse 17, he told us the world is passing away. We need to understand, don't put our hope in the things of this world because all of that's passing away. Now he's gonna get kind of deeper into that. And in verse 18, he says, little children, notice, you know what, if you're a Bible underliner, I always underline that part. You know, when, when, I, when I see something like that, I go, yeah, that's me. I like that, right? I like the idea that that's how God looks at me. But sorry. So listen, a term of endearment that John is giving. And he says, listen, little children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come by which we know that it is the last hour. So John is bringing up some things here. I think we probably should define a little bit, get an understanding of, and I think it might help us. Some say, well, John really blew it because it wasn't the last hour because the Antichrist didn't come. And he never said, listen, he's going to be here now. He just said it's the last hour. And he says it twice, so I don't think it's a mistake. And don't ever forget, the Holy Spirit is the one who's writing this. He's just using John. So 
last hour, listen, last hour, I think simply means this. From the time Jesus came, the first time, until he comes again. We are in the last days. We are in the last hour. We need to understand that he could show up at any time. And what blows my mind, once again, here's John in, I believe, around 90, 95 A.D., and what does he say? He says, listen, he says, it's the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming. What does that tell you? You know what it tells me? John was expecting Jesus to show up. John had that anticipation of the second coming of Jesus, and we should all live like that. That's how we should be as believers. We should understand he can show up at any minute. And so listen, now he talks about that Antichrist coming. Who is the Antichrist? I wish we knew, right? We don't know who he is, but we know what he is. We, if you've been with us, we studied in, in uh, 2 Thessalonians especially, the, the description there. And this is one who will come on the scene, who will be very charismatic. He's going to come on the scene. He's going to solve a lot of world problems seemingly. And he's going to unite everybody and bring everybody together. And everybody is going to be really happy and for this guy. And most of all, this Antichrist will make peace in the Middle East secure. And he will make a seven-year contract with Israel. We know that from Scripture. So that's what he's talking about in the beginning. He says, the Antichrist is coming. And my Bible has it, a capital A. I think that's kind of weird, but the Antichrist is coming. But then he says this, even now, many Antichrists have come. Oh. So John's saying, listen, there's a whole bunch of them. And I think a couple things he's saying here. Number one, when we talked about it in 2 Thessalonians, I believe every generation has an antichrist in the waiting because, hey, Satan doesn't know when Jesus is coming back. Nobody knows. So you gotta have one ready. You gotta have this person ready to step up and take that role. He could be that, but I think, listen, I think he's talking about there's a lot of people who are coming and antichrist simply means it, well, it's got two meanings. It can mean against Christ, but it can also mean instead of Christ. And when he says there's many, listen, there's a lot of people in John's generation, there's a lot of people in our generation who want to replace Jesus, who want to, you know, redefine him and bring about and, and bring this Jesus who's not the biblical Jesus. When I talk to people about Jesus, not, not church people, but when I talk to people on the street and stuff, I ask them, if they tell me they know about Jesus, I ask them what their definition of Jesus is because I want to know. They may have a completely different Jesus than I'm talking about. Cults have a totally different Jesus. you got to get them to define terms. And now we're going to kind of get into that truth thing. So here's what he says. There's a whole bunch. There's many antichrists, and how do we know that? Because they're proving that it's the last hour. And then John says this. He says, they went out from us. Who is they? The Antichrist, right? These went out from us. So John, here's what that implies. They were part of us. Now, brainiacs want to know who the us is. I'm a simple guy. I just read my Bible and believe it. And when it says us, I'm assuming that John means us, right? The church. It always cracks me up. Well, we need to dig a little bit deeper and try and understand. That always bothers me. Listen, if he says they went out from us, what's he talking about? They were part of the church. Now, I believe he's writing to the church in Ephesus. I could be wrong. Some people say he's writing to, you know, a, a multitude of churches. But here's what he's saying. They were part of the church. These that he's writing about, they were part of the church. So they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would, not, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. Now listen, there's a lot of stuff, right? Sounds like a little bit of mind twisting going on as he's talking there. But here's what he's saying. We know that they're not part of us. Why? Because they departed. He's not talking about they just went on a trip or went on a vacation or moved. He's saying they left because 
And here's the kicker. Because they could not stand with the doctrine that was being taught. And that's proof that they weren't part of us. There are people, I, I, I may be a little bold, there's some people here this morning, they're not part of us. And they will go out from us. Now, I want to be careful because don't think that everybody who leaves our church is a heretic. Because you can get some people kind of, listen, people leave churches for, we, we live in a different generation where people can go to another church and it's okay. I always tell people that. They'll go, I can't believe, it's all right, take a breath, it's okay. So he's not talking about going from one church to another because they didn't have a whole bunch of churches. There was one church, I, I do kind of like that idea, but hey, I know we all worship differently and et cetera, and we're not gonna get into that long debate. But listen, they went out, they left the faith. They walked away, and that proves that they were never part of the faith to begin with. It proves that they just had some kind of maybe emotional reaction or something, and now, listen, now they have a whole different belief system. And listen, that can happen. That can happen even in, you know, quote, a good Bible teaching church. There can be people who all of a sudden get caught up in something and they start going for that, which kind of proves that they were never part of it to begin with. He's not saying that people lose their salvation. He's saying they were never part of us and they proved it by leaving, by not continuing. And they mainly left, and I find this all the time, when you get down to some nitty gritty doctrine, some people get real upset. And my favorite line is, I don't like doctrine. Oh, yeah, you do. Because if you didn't like doctrine, you wouldn't care what I said. But because you have your own doctrine, you're saying you don't like the doctrine I'm teaching. Now, so John, John lays that out to them and lets them know this is what's going on. And again, little children, here's what he's saying in 18 and 19. We need to be careful. We need to understand. There are, there's an enemy of our souls. I think most of us understand that, right? We have an enemy of our souls, and he's going to use people around us. So we need to be discerning. And now we're going to get into it. I almost, I almost spoiled it. So I have, you have to wait to the end because we have to find out how we can be discerning. So listen, verse 20. Well, he's starting it here. So they went out from us, but you. So are, are you kind of figuring out, listen, there's a contrast, right? It's they, the Antichrist, those who are against Christ, but you, the church, right? He's talking to the faithful, and he says, but you, he says, you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. Now, some of your translations, and, and mine has a footnote, but some of your translations might say, and you all know, instead of you know all things. And there's a big debate, which is true. Is it the Texas one, y'all know, or is it you know all things? Which one, which one was it? And, you know, I, I believe, listen, I believe he's saying you know all things. Now, he's not saying that everything to know you know, What's he talking about? He's talking about our salvation. And here's what he's assuring those believers with. You have an anointing from the Holy One. Here's what he's saying. When you're born again, when you're truly born again, the Holy Spirit comes up in you and indwells in you. And because he's in you, you know everything you need to know for salvation. Doesn't mean we're not gonna grow. Doesn't mean we're not gonna have a greater understanding of that. But there's no secret thing you need to find out later on. Nothing that you have to come to me and I go, hey, you know what? Come in my office. I have, I have something for you. Do you know what I'm talking about? So he says, listen, because you have, and, and I didn't know this till this time I was studying that word anointing. And originally, the word anointing, Old Testament and New Testament, means this, to smear with. Now, here's what I kind of like. I, I got to dwelling on that this week. I got to meditating on this. And here's what I came up with. I'm smeared with the Holy Spirit. Does that sound good? Like, I'm smeared all over, man. He... So here's what he says. You have the Holy One. You have this. And he says, 
Don't believe that you're missing something that these people are trying to tell you this little secret thing. Years ago, I remember looking into something and there was a ministry, it was in this area. I don't know how big it got. I tried to Google it and I, and I couldn't get anywhere. It was called the King's Word or King's Word Ministry. And that, always, that sounds good, doesn't it? I want to know the King's Word. I began to delve into it and the whole point was if you hung with them long enough and you stayed with them long enough, eventually you would get this blessing that you could be like Jesus. Not just like him like we are like him, but like him in the sense that you could raise the dead, heal the sick, do these things. But you, and here's the whole thing. You had to get the king's word in you. And you had to find, and you had to go to these meetings. Hmm? And you had to get this secret anointing and find us out. What a bunch of garbage. That's what Paul, or Paul, who are we talking about? John. That's what John is talking about here when he says, listen, you have that anointing. You don't need, you don't need this secret thing. And hey, it's alive and well today. It's alive and well in cults. You have people that knock on your door that try and tell you you don't believe things right. They've redefined Jesus. And again, we'll talk about that a little bit more. But listen, you can, you can know because you have the anointing. John MacArthur said it this way. I love this. He says, they, talking about this group here in verse 20, they do not need any secret, special, or transcendent understanding or esoteric insight. Now, listen, I know there's kind of some words there that maybe we're not familiar with, but do you hear what he's saying? Man, don't let people act like they got something you don't have. You have the Holy Spirit. So John is saying that. Now, he goes a little bit further. That's verse 19. Then verse 20, or I'm sorry, that's verse 20. Then 21, he says, I have written to you because you do, or I'm sorry, I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it and that there is no lie in the truth. Do you hear what he's saying? We have the truth. And there is a truth, and there's a truth we can stand on, and we need to understand that. And John says, I wrote to you, not because you don't have the truth, but because you do have the truth, I'm encouraging you. I'm trying to build your faith and, and build your confidence in your relationship with God so that you are not deceived by those people who come along with little secret things and secret doctrines and different things. And he says, that's why I wrote to you. Then he says this in verse 22, who is a liar? Woo! That's pretty heavy, isn't it? This is the apostle of love. He just called everybody who doesn't agree with him a liar. Man, you know, when I, read, when I read John, like especially his letters, I'm thinking this guy was not so loving at times, right? But he was. Because he loved enough to call people out. So I'm not advocating that we need to go around and tell people you're a liar, you know, and kind of get into that. But we need to understand that in our hearts, and we need to know that. So here's what he says. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is the Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. So here's what he's telling us. When you deny the Jesus of the Bible, the Jesus who's revealed in Scripture, you're a liar. And the truth is not in you. We need to, listen, we need to know that. There's only one Jesus, and it's a Jesus in Scripture. When I do funerals, I generally will go to John chapter 14, and if you're familiar with that. In John chapter 14, well, right before John chapter 14, that's part of where he's in the upper room, he's just washed your feet, he's, you know, that's part of that whole uh, time, uh, 13, 14, 15, 16, are all happening in that, that last time they're gathered together. And Jesus made it perfectly clear in 13, he's going away. And these guys are freaking out. Think about, think about you've invested everything in this guy, and he says, well, I'm leaving, what do you mean you're leaving? I'm leaving. 
And then in chapter 14, verse 1, he says, but don't let your hearts be troubled. That's always, I love that, right? He's saying, don't, here's what he's saying, don't freak out. It's okay. And then he says, you believe in God, but you need to believe also in me. You see, it's not enough to have some generic God. You have to believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who came to die for our sins. So he lays that out, and then he goes on and he says, right, I go away, and if I go away, I would prepare a place for you. There's many mansions. He talks about all of that. And if I go away, then you can come too. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. And most of the disciples are doing this. You know, like when somebody talks, it's like sometimes I'm talking and you guys do this. And in here, you've got no clue what I'm talking about. You're clueless, but it's, it, uh, people do that. It's fun to watch people. It's fun as a speaker to watch people. You always, sometimes you want to say, what did I just say? But I would never do that to you guys, ever, ever. But listen, all the disciples are doing this except one, Tommy. I love Thomas. People call him Doubting Thomas. I call him Honest Thomas because Thomas always brought up the questions that everybody else wanted to ask. He was always honest about things. So they're all doing this, and Tommy goes, excuse me. He goes, we don't even know where you're going. How can we know the way? Right? He's being honest. We have no idea what you're talking. It's like, <laughs> And then my favorite favorite verse. Jesus says, Tommy, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's scripture. That's Jesus. And we need to know that there's no other way. There's not multiple ways. There's not some secret code that you can understand. You've got to come through Jesus, period. And here's what John just said. You deny that, you're an antichrist. You deny that, you're a liar. You don't have the truth. And I think it's okay to confront people. I've had conversations. I, I know that, you know, my house got marked by the Jehovah's Witness. They don't come and knock on my door <laughs> because I sit down and have a conversation with them. They came to my house once when we lived out in the canyons and I had this conversation in my front yard because uh, they didn't come in. And we went for quite a while and it wasn't really an argument. I was just, and then at the end I said, hey, and, and the younger one, or she should have younger and older one, the younger one told me his name. I think it was Paul. And I said, you know what, Paul, I'm gonna pray for you. And the older one said, you can't. And I go, I know his name, I can. <laughs> and I'm gonna pray for him. You can't do that. I go, I'm gonna pray for him. And they ended up leaving, and my neighbor, who's not a believer, came over, and it was hilarious. He goes, you won that argument. <laughs> now listen, it's not good to win an argument and lose a soul, and I wasn't just trying to argue, but I was proving to them that their belief system is wrong. It's wrong. And there's nothing, listen, there's nothing bad about telling somebody that's wrong, that's false, that's not true. We can do that. You don't have to do it in a mean way. You can do it in a kind way, but you can do it in a firm way. And that's what John here is doing. He says, listen, they're liars. He says, hey, he who denies Jesus the, is the Christ, is, he is the Antichrist and denies the Father and Son. You can't, listen, you can't make up your own God and everything be okay. So John's saying that. Now, obviously, these guys, the Gnostics, they had this secret thing going on. Number one, they didn't believe that Jesus was the Son of God. Uh, you know, probably, probably by John's time, again, Gnosticism was not full-blown yet till the third century, but it's, it's in its infant stage. And remember when we opened up John, I talked about the guy, Sorrentus, who was in the bathhouse, and John had a fit and said, you know, the whole place is going to cave in because the heretic's in there. And somebody asked me, what happened? I don't know what happened. I just know John said that. Obviously, it didn't cave in on Sorrentus. But listen, they, and they had this whole idea that Jesus was born of Mary and Joseph, 
And at his baptism, the Spirit came upon him. He did the ministry. Then on the cross, the Spirit left him and went back with the Father. So they, they had this whole new thinking. And listen, it sounds, some of it sounds good. And you go, oh, I kind of like that. Well, you know, that doesn't mean it's true. Just because people are sincere doesn't mean it's true. You can be sincerely wrong. So John is calling them out and telling them that, and he's telling us that. And then listen to verse 23. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. You, listen, once again, you lose the Son, you lose God, period. Because why? Because Jesus is God, He's not just part of God. He's not just a piece of God. He is God. And you can't do that. Listen, you cannot do that. So he says, uh, listen, whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. Now, here's the flip side. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Yes. And that's what Jesus said. You come to the Father through me. Then John says, therefore, now listen, here's the conclusion. Here's, here's, here's where we're going to get some stuff for us, right? Hopefully, hopefully you understand. You do have to know there's truth and there's error. There's what the Bible says and there's what people make up. So then he says, therefore, since, since all of this is happening to them, therefore, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he has promised us, eternal life. Oh, yes. Do you hear what he's saying? It's not enough to say, just say I believe it. It's not enough to just read your Bible. It's got to abide in you. It's got to become part of you. You got to internalize it. You got to grab it and let it get down in you and become part of you. That's what abiding means, right? It means it's part of you. It's hanging out in you. And for me to have victory over false teaching, I got to have the word of God in me. Not, listen, not just memorized. Do you know that parrots can repeat things? I just thought I'd throw that out there. It's getting it in you. And here's what John is saying. He's brought up the anointing, right? The Holy Spirit. Here's what he's saying. We have to have the Holy Spirit and the word in order to be victorious. If you just have the word, you're gonna have some dead intellectual faith. If you just have the spirit, I don't know what you're gonna have. Because people with the, that just do the spirit, they get a little woo, right? But if you get the spirit and the word together, you have strength. And that's what he's talking about. He's letting them know that, you, yes, you have the word, it's going to abide in you, but then you have the spirit to interpret the word and so that you have truth. So listen, he's saying, let it get in you and let it abide in you. You and I need to understand that. And we need to get, listen, we need to get people. I know we encourage you to read through the Bible. I believe that with all my heart because if you're reading through the Bible, at least something's going to get in there. Right? You know, sometimes in Scripture it talks about recalling and, and having that recall of Scripture. Well, you can only recall what you've read. So kind of keep that in mind. But listen, man, he's saying, let it abide in you. And he says, this is a promise he, he, that we have. He's promised us eternal uh, life. Then he says, these things I have written to you, verse 28 and 6. He says, these things I have written to you concerning those who try to deceive you. There are people who want to deceive you. And guess what? They're not going to have a lanyard around their neck with a big sign that says, deceiver. They're not going to have a tag on them that says, deceiver. Some of them have name tags. 
Someone laughed. <laughs> yeah, you know those guys, right? They usually are on bicycles. <laughs> Listen, but they're not going to come. They're not going to come and do that. And we need to know that. They're going to come in the name of Jesus. And they're going to proclaim Jesus, but not the Jesus we worship. Their Jesus could be the brother of, of Satan. Their Jesus might be Michael the archangel. I'm naming some of the cults. And they're going to come and do that. So we need to understand that. And here's what John says. I wrote this to you. Why? So that you will know. Listen. So that you will. I've written to you concerning those who try to deceive you. He doesn't want us to be deceived. The Father does not want us to be deceived. Now listen. I believe. Listen. I believe greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I believe that with all my heart. But I also know that the one who's greater in me has given me opportunity to read his word, to study his word, and to be involved in fellowship and to walk in the spirit so that I won't be deceived. So John is saying, listen, man, I don't want those guys to get a hold of you. And then he says probably one of the most misunderstood verses in the Bible he says, but, verse 27, the anointing, remember we talked about the anointing, right? The smearing. He says, but the anointing which you have received from him abides in you. So what has he just said? Let the word abide in you and let him abide in you. We need both, the spirit and the word. But he says, he says the one you've received abides in you and you do not need that anyone teach you but as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, it is, tr it is true and it is, is true and is not a lie. And just as it has taught you, you will abide in him. Huh. Some people interpret this and say, we don't need any teachers. It's not what he says. Because I think it's important. I don't believe the Bible ever contradicts itself. And in Ephesians, he says, listen, he says the Spirit has given the church this gift. He's given prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Why would God give the church teachers if no one needs to be taught, according to verse 27. Verse 27 can't mean that we don't need any teachers. I know that, why? Because the Bible talks about the gift of teaching. The Bible talks about teachers in the body of Christ. And it's not just because I'm a teacher I believe that. I don't think the Bible would contradict itself. So what exactly, well, listen, when he says, he says, when you receive, he abides in you, and you do not need anyone teach you, but the same anointing is going to teach you. What is he talking about? What's the context? Deceivers. And deceivers, listen, you have what you need to stand against deceivers. And when he's not, he's not talking, he's talking about people who come in and say, I have a special teaching for you. You ever have anybody do that to you? You ever have anybody come and try and draw you away? And one of their favorite lines is this. What I'm about to tell you, do not share with your pastor. I love it when they do that. Because here's what they're saying. I'm trying to rip off your soul. So why would they not want you to share it with your pastor? Because your pastor's gonna go, that person is a liar and a heretic. That's why. I remember years ago there was a book, I, I can't remember the name of it, it was circulating in the, in the 80s. The 80s was a weird time to be a Christian. And in the 80s, I can't remember what the book was, but I remember I read the preface and the preface went through some pretty, pretty spooky stuff, you know, kind of like, and then, and then I remember in big bold letters it says, do not share this book with your pastor. Woo! Something's wrong when people are telling you that, right? Do you guys agree? A couple of you do. Most of you are going, I got that book. <laughs> Listen when they do that. So here's what he's saying. He's saying be careful of those who have the secret teaching. 
Be careful of those who are coming and trying to give you something new. Do you know in scripture, do you know there's no new truth? If it's new, it ain't true. And if it's true, it ain't new. I don't think, listen, I don't think I have anything new to give people. All I do is read the Bible and hopefully explain what we already know and make it a little bit bigger for us, a little bit more understandable for us, but I don't have something new to give you. I don't dig in and go, wait till you guys hear this. And when somebody does that, it frightens me. And John is saying, listen, we don't need that. Chuck Swindoll said it this way. Listen, he says, because of this anointing of the Holy Spirit abiding in us, we have no need of false teachers peddling their newfangled doctrines. I kind of like that, right? He says, their new and improved scriptures or their unheard of gospel. The original anointing we received when we accepted Christ as the God-man who died and rose again, the true gospel that gives eternal life, he says, that teaches us everything we need for life and godliness. And we need to know that. Doesn't mean it can't be expanded on. Doesn't mean it can't be opened up. But God forbid when somebody comes and says, I have a new thing for you, watch out. Or John MacArthur says this. Here's another quote. We'll end with these two quotes, maybe. John's point is that believers must not rely on human wisdom or man-centered philosophy, but on the teaching of God's word by spirit-gifted human teachers and the illuminating work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Be careful. That's what he's saying. He's, saying we don't, he's not saying, oh, you know what? You don't need anybody to show you anything. I don't know about you guys, but I'm learning every day of my salvation, learning about my God, and I'm gonna spend all of eternity learning about him. But listen, that's a good thing. So, here's the deal. There are people who want to deceive you. They're not going to tell you, but they're going to work at it. And we need to be careful, and they will even come as part of the church. Be careful who you listen to. Be discerning. And here's how you can be discerning. You only need two things, the spirit and the word. And you have those two things you can have discernment and you can understand that is not true. It's amazing to me in my life, even as a young Christian, when I would hear something, it just rings in you, that's not right. Something's not right. And you just kind of know, it's good, then stay away from those things. Years ago, a lady came to a church, I wasn't done with after the two quotes, but years ago, years ago, a lady came, we were part of a church, and, and this was a whole weird thing, and I refused to go to some of the meetings, and some of the people that I was associated with went to the meetings, and, and they go, why aren't you going? And I said, I just don't, something's inside of me saying, don't go. And they're going, oh, Pat, you're a legalist, and they were right, I was, but other than that, I just said, and then, you know what, at the end of this quote, session or weekend, the most bizarre stuff came out of her mouth. And they go, wow, you were right. And I go, I didn't, I didn't know anything. I just felt something. We have the Spirit. Listen to him. He will guide and direct us and teach us. Listen to him. Let's stand up and pray. Father, thank you, God. Thank you just... As we read this, it challenges us. I know, I know that it, it speaks to our hearts, yes, but it also challenges us. It's hard when you live in a culture that is so complete opposite of what John is calling us to here in this passage. And I just pray, Holy Spirit, that you would take up residence in us and that you would give us just that empowering to stand firm for your truth. To be people who are not going to cave, not going to turn, but we're gonna stay steadfast in your truth. Not arrogantly. You tell us to be prepared to give everyone an answer, but to do it with meekness 
and humiliation. And we want to do that. And so, Lord, I do pray that you would just work in our lives and let us be a people who are more in love with you. And I'm going to ask you to stay in an attitude of prayer uh, for just a couple more minutes. And if you are here and you've never asked Jesus to forgive your sins, you've never asked him to come into your life and take control of your life, today's the day to do it. As we quoted earlier, he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him. That gets exclusive. And that's kind of what freaks some people out. But here's the good news. Anyone can come to him. Anyone can receive him. But you got to be honest. You got to be open. You got to understand that you've sinned against God and you've offended him. By sinning, you've offended a holy and righteous God. And what you've earned by that is God's wrath. That's bad news. The good news is Jesus, when he went to the cross, he took the wrath that you deserve, the wrath that I deserve upon himself, and he paid for your sin. And now today he holds out to you this receipt that says, hey, your debt has been paid. Your sin is taken care of. And all you have to do is take that. In order to take that, Talk to him. Tell him you want to be saved. So I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And you can say this prayer with me out loud. You can say it silently. It's not volume. What matters is your heart needs to be sincere. If you're backslidden today, hey, maybe you came to church because it's the first of the year. You made a resolution. I need to get back into church. And you know you had that relationship and it's grown cold. And you're backslidden. You're away from him. You know what? Come home. Come back to Jesus. Say this prayer with us. And he will hear you. If you're watching online, you can say the prayer right where you're at. You don't have to be in this building. You can say it there in, in your home or wherever you're at. Jesus, today I confess to you that I am a sinner. I'm sorry that I sinned against you. And right now I'm asking you to forgive me. Jesus, thank you for dying for my sin. Thank you today for your forgiveness. And right now I want you to come into my heart and change me. Jesus, I want you to come into my life and guide me. I'm asking you to be my Lord and my Savior.